Hello. Hello, Larry. Hello. Hello. Hey! Oh my gosh! And video. <laughs> what? We, we don't see you. Where are you? I'm. I'm. Uh, didn't have the camera on. There we go. Okay. Hey. Nice to see you. Good to see you. How are you? I'm. I'm. I'm good. I was gonna say it's, and it's just that easy. Wow. But I think the pipes are better today. A little, <laughs> somewhat bigger. It's. They seem to what? be. What? Oh. <laughs> what? Maybe I have jinxed it. Uh, <laughs> Just now we had a. Oh, what happened? Oh. <laughs> Do you see us? It's... Yeah, I can see you fine. Yeah, you can't see me. No, we see you. Okay, but we we had a little lag in the in the sun. Well. Oh, okay. This is my good friend George. Hello, nice. Hi, George. <laughs> Hi. And we'll be doing this interview together today. Okay. Nope, I refuse one at a time. Oh, <laughs> no way. Okay, or maybe yeah. I will. Okay, that's, that's fine. Okay. So let, let yeah, you're, not, you're not recording the picture, are you? Uh, are, we are. You are? Do you want us not to? Oh, no, no, that's okay. I just, I'm just uh, glad I <laughs> shaved. I think I shaved. Did I shave? Okay. Well, you look great, but... <laughs> okay, do the, uh, the earphones clunky or anything? Or? No, oh. it's, it's okay. No? You're not. Nice. I, uh... Yeah. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I'd plug it. Okay. As ever. Okay, you're sure. Wow. Okay, oh. I didn't. Uh, hold on. Did I make up. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Okay. Well, I can see your ceiling really well. You you do know that, right? <laughs> but do you see our faces as well? No, thank goodness. No, I. <laughs> <laughs> you're mean. You're mean today. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's it must be crawling through these tiny pipes that. Uh, well, these, uh, these pipes in Greece are, are <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Except you're in Italy, right? Well, right now I'm in Greece for vacation. Oh, okay. I'll be you, to Italy you miss the pipes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, we have to stop doing the pipe show because. You know. <laughs> so okay. The beginning. okay. Then, then let let me start. Yeah, and let me start from the beginning. Oh, okay. Um, early on, you started the fan club, uh, Starbase ECU, and then you founded Thundercon, and then you started your soon to be huge archive on Star Trek. So, I I'd like to ask you did all these things play a role on your beginning to professionally work for Star Trek? Oh, well, well yeah, uh, yes. Um... Uh, it always it always kills me when somebody starts talking about things I did in college, and then I went, well, it is online, so the whole world knows, <laughs> I guess. Um, I just think about you know, fifteen people knowing that or something, but that's the internet. No, I mean, I had a, I was, I when I grew up, I had a lot of interests. In mm -hmm. fact, I was like cursed by too many interests. <laughs> I mean, I love, I liked, uh, I liked, uh, I was a big, I was a big NASA kid. Now we'd say a NASA geek, but I would always say a NASA kid, um, NASA fan before I was a Star Trek fan even. And I would – because it was the, the um, Apollo land missions were going, and I could tell you all the astronauts and what was the nickname of the ships and exactly how a Saturn V worked and exactly all the docking and rendezvousing and, you know, and what an EVA was and what a translunar injection was and all this. And um, – but I was also a big history fan, and I loved, and I was a stamp collector, and I was a model railroader, and I did model rocketry, and um, when I was, I suddenly, when I was like going through junior high and high school, I was starting to get terrified. But I didn't know what I wanted to do <laughs> when I grew up because I couldn't pick, and I had a lot of teachers in my family, and uh, I knew I would be a good teacher in two or three subjects. And when I got to high school, I I started doing journalism and I did theater, and uh, I was I had always taken piano and I studied voice in high school, and um, did contests, and and um, so I just had like a big thing. So I was like terrified of going to college and picking a major and all that stuff. So um, so I wound up not going into broadcasting because of where I was going to school. I wound up going into into written journalism and even though I and then I went to grad school to get a master's degree in theater 
I know this makes a lot of sense because I wanted to be able to teach theater in college later because I thought that's what I wanted to do. So it's – and then I got back, and um, that was a harder – that I decided I did not want – I was sick of school. and I did not want a doctorate. I didn't want a PhD. So for the time being, I just got a job. I looked for jobs, and I got a job at uh, a daily newspaper, and that's where I worked for 11 years. <laughs> but all that time, we had – if it wasn't work, then it was a hobby. So all that time, Star Trek went from being uh, – you know, we were in the fallow time, but in all that time, they were doing the movies, and the next generation came back. And at the same time, desktop publishing was coming in, and Macintosh computers were coming in. And um, I had some Macintosh gurus at work, and they were like, "No, no, no, don't mess with, you know, PCs and all that. Just uh, and IBM's. Just uh, just do Mac. It'll be a lot smarter, and you can do more." And uh, and so I did, and that's when I did my first com uh, concordance because Next Generation came out. And I thought, okay, I missed the boat on the first go round, but I'm going to be right here in the beginning with the new show. So um, yeah, so I started doing a concordance like B. Jozo concordance, and uh, only it was all online. And I started using FileMaker and uh, to keep track of it, and that's where my databases started. Mm -hmm. And um, between that and having a laser printer, I did a really slick um, annual. Now we'd say encyclopedia after the, after Mike and Denise's, but at the time we have a same concordance. And you can still get those on eBay, but I would do like fifty and sell them around. Um, around uh, town, and um, after two or three years, people at Paramount said, uh, he, he should be doing this for, <laughs> he should be doing this nationally. And that was before the internet, and before there was Memory Alpha, and before there were even book, Next Generation books. There were novels, but there was no nonfiction. There was no behind the scenes reference books. So the first two books from the modern era that came out were Mike and Rick's uh, technical man Next Generation Technical Manual and My Companion. And after that, it was like, well, that was exciting. And um, we decided to move to L.A. because my, there was nothing to do in Oklahoma. I was kind of bumping my head on the ceiling, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a phrase like that. And um, so, yeah, everything that came from that was kind of scary and wasn't exactly sure what was going on. Uh, and kind of like the way the world is today, not exactly sure what's going on. <laughs> but, um, that's yeah, that's where it all started. So definitely um, – Definitely started with those first uh, things. And, and you, you talk about ThunderCon, and I worked on SoonerCon in our local fan club. That's what, you know, if you had an itch and you didn't just want to sit home with it, um, that's what we did. And, and I found a circle of people in central Oklahoma, and um, we, were, we were seeding little clubs and, <laughs> and events and things everywhere we went. So, so yeah, I'm just I'm just probably glad that there aren't more pictures online from those days. <laughs> <laughs> so your uh, your feeling uh, from uh, going from uh, being a fan to actually working for Star Trek was scared. Well, see, I think one of the things I think has been good for me was that I had not just I had all those interests, but I had. I had training in, in theater and in performance, and I knew what putting a show together was like, even though it was live. I didn't have much film experience then, but we had done some film projects. But I knew what that was like, and I knew what uh, writing, professional writing was like. And I was a fan, and I always thought those three things together gave me a great insight because I could go – I knew what a fan would – If you know, I felt like I was able to – be a professional writer I feel like I was able to understand whether it was writers or directors or actors the people I was talking to I was able to understand their problems and you didn't just walk in and go why did you do this instead of that it's like well because uh, no one would pay to do that you know or it's because <laughs> I would be uh, kicked out of my union if I did that or you know whatever I, I understood the way entertainment world worked the industry worked and I could be professional in the way I, I uh, both carried myself and also my output. And then also as a fan, I knew the right things to write and not just the millionth you know, question that any other writer would ask. So I just felt I, was, I had a good blend there. And now that we have the digital revolution and everybody has a, you know, everybody has a movie studio on their laptop, 
there's probably a lot more of me out there. But at the time, I think I had kind of a unique niche, if that makes sense. So there's lots of there's lots of really smart people new who are now well they write for the, they work on the shows. <laughs> By the end of Voyager Enterprise, we had a lot of fanboys and fangirls who were writing on the shows and who were actors and who were designers, you know, from within. And now with media, you don't have to be a trained writer, although it helps. <clears throat> but there are you know there are a lot of people that jump up and think they're uh, a blogger or a writer and they have no clue. But um, you know, there's probably a lot more people now that it's able, you're able to combine those. But that's what I that's what I think it was. Yeah. Right. And as a writer in uh, 1994, uh, you and Johnny wrote an episode together called uh, Reflections for Voyager. Is that right? Yes. That later would be updated and rewritten as Prophecy. Right. Uh, how how easy was it writing for a, for a show that hadn't even started yet? Well, we. You know, Janet worked there, so we had an. That was the end that we had. Was that she was? I mean, I, I was known to everyone because I'd been working on. I'd done the next gen book, mm -hmm. and we had moved to L.A. And so we were kind of in that up and coming, uh, view then. And uh, so Jerry Taylor was very good to uh, let us come in and pitch, and the guys on DS9 were good to let us come in and pitch, and. Um, and that was back when they had the open door policy of you didn't have to have an, an agent, which was rare. That was that was Michael Pillar's idea, and that lasted all through, all three of his shows, even after he was gone. When Enterprise started, they decided to end it just because, sadly, it, it, even though you had to sign a release form, which took care of the legal bugaboo, which was the whole reason Hollywood didn't do it in the first place. More and more and more people, sadly, most of them from around the country who didn't know the way it worked who didn't get the idea that their idea may have been pitched by five other people. You know, They thought, oh my God, this is such a unique idea. Well, they had more and more people uh, challenging the credits when something, it's, that's my show, you stole it. And I didn't have any, you know. It's like, no, we had 18 other people pitch the same idea. We just went with the best one. But people didn't get that. And even if they would settle and they would do an arbitration through the Writers Guild, they still got paid, you know, they would still pay them 500 or 2,000 or something. And after a while, it wasn't even so much the money. It just got to be a trouble. It just sucked up so much time. So they sadly, they ended it. And you know, part of that was with the whole thing of Enterprise trying to focus anyway and didn't need all this distraction. So, um, so that went away. But yeah, we, um, we did. We pitched several times. And as, as I used to say at cons, when we would, I mean, there was a time when Janet and I would do a whole panel hour on that experience. And I guess I still could. But... Um, we uh, um, what's funny is that was the first time we pitched. Everybody, including our good friend Lolita, Janet's boss then, said, "Now no one ever sells anything on their first pitch session." And you know we had like four or five ideas, and we worked really hard on the other ones. And then I said, um, and, and we knew this because Janet was working there. So this was we pitched in November. They bought it in December. And uh, uh, Caretaker aired at the end of January. So that's, you know, that's how it was. But they'd been shooting the show for six months. They were six or seven shows in. So we knew on the inside what the state of the show was. Mm -hmm. And these were all baby characters. I don't mean infants. I mean, well, I mean, as a character development, they were babies. And we knew where they were going even out of the pilot and even out of the writer's guide setup. So, um, so that was a help. And at the time, you know, like we were trying to pair Bellana up with somebody subconsciously, and it hadn't aired yet, but Cathexis had just had her say that thing about Chakotay. And we were going back and forth between if Bellana had a latent interest, would it be with Chakotay or would it be with Paris? <laughs> Even huh. at the time, and we were going back and forth on that. So, um, and that wasn't anything they were doing overtly in the show. We just needed somebody to, to chill her out a little bit on something. But... Um, but yeah, so that's what, so at, you say before it even aired, it aired. But we knew as much as anybody knew, aside from being in the brains of Jerry and Michael uh, and Rick Merman, uh, we knew as much as anybody did at the time about where the show was going and right. what to do. And and then right, and then they and then they went away and and all that. But what I was going to say was, that was the idea that we were making all our. We worked really hard on our. I, one of them was about basically it was like joining a wagon train. It was like they were all alone and they come across some other ships that the caretaker not the caretakers taken but some other ships that are all alone, 
and um, they get in with them, and it's just like a, it's it's like literally it was like a wagon train to the stars. It was like they were in wagon train, and there was drama with some of the other ships and crews. And come to think of it, it was a lot like the void later on. Now that I think about it, hmm, without the void, but um, but anyway, we spent a lot of time on shows like that. And then at one point, I said, okay, they've got this character that's half Klingon. We ought to throw in this story about. Oh my god, we're in the Delta Quadrant and we come across a Klingon ship because it's a generational ship and it's all part of this secret outflanking maneuver the Klingons did, you know, in Kirk's time to try to get around the Federation and they just sent people out on long range. You know, they kind of founderized Klingons and just sent them out scattered on these ships with people agreeing to kind of like kamikaze Japanese pilots only instead of killing yourself, you just knew you would be leaving home forever and you would be the start of a you know, so um, so we set that up, and we said it can be a plot device. It, as as Voyager comes back closer to the Alpha Quadrant, they can find another Klingon colony, you know, that they've come across or whatever. So, um, but it was a throwaway idea. It was like, okay, they've got this Klingon half Klingon, so let's here's our token stupid little Klingon, and of course that's the one they bought. <laughs> <laughs> So, were there any major changes between the original script and the one that, that aired six years oh, later? Oh, well, yeah. Well, when we pitched that, like I said, they were baby characters. Mm -hmm. And Bellana, we still had her very raw about her half Klingon side. And the whole point of the story was they come across a, this Klingon generational ship, and the Klingons, of course, don't believe there's been a detente, there's been an alliance. And they know that Voy they believe the part about Voyager being much later because they can see it, they can scan it, they can you know all that, and they get it that they're a, and they there's a little bit of a battle at first, but they understand real fast that they've they've got nothing on these guys. They're a hundred years older technology, so the Klingon captain feigns uh, acceptance of this, and Janeway's like, oh good, the rule of reason has overcome you know our violent tendencies and all. You do a great Janeway, by the way. <laughs> oh my gosh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Paris. Um, so, uh, Chakotay, Chakotay, Chakotay. See, I just, all you have to do is just do Audrey Hepburn, and, um, which is what Kate Mulgrew did. The first thing after Voyager ended, ended she did her Kate Hepburn one woman show, T at Five, or what it was called. Anyway, um, you know, but that since it was a Bellana show, the whole point was that Janeway puts Bellana in charge. Now that they're friends, you know, and when we pitched it as a bottle show, it was just ship to ship. So all they had to do was haul the Klingon sets out of storage and bang. And you know, it was a bottle show. Look, guys, it's cheap to do. And uh, it's just the Klingons and the extras. But um, we made Bellana the focal point because Janeway made her the focal point. All right, Bellana, you're going to be our liaison. It makes sense. And she's like, no, Captain, I hate my Klingon half, basically. You know, So she hated the fact that she had to go be Klingon. After she was trying to get away from it, you know, she was still very raw in those days. And in like Dad Gummit, she goes over, and the whole point of the Klingons is the captain has told his engineer, "Okay, you're gonna. Oh, look, it's a woman. You're gonna use her." He basically pulls a Kirk and says, "You're gonna use her to get at them, and we'll outsmart them because we're Klingon, and they're still, you know, slimy, whiny humans." And um, and will overcome. You know, they'll take over. They'll take over Voyager. They'll hijack Voyager using Bellana as a weak spot. So that's what happens. And you know, the guy seduces Bellana, um, and lo and behold, she realizes it. So she hates herself even more. <laughs> so now there's fear and loathing that she's. Oh damn it! Now I've fallen for one of them. Damn it! And then she finds out the plot. That they've taken, they take over, or they're about to take over. So now she hates herself even more because, see, I let myself fall for one. Good God! And now I'm, now I'm going to betray, you know. And she's still a Maquis-ish, so she could even be like, "Well, crap! I hated these people three months ago or six months ago, and now I'm in here trying to, you know, save them." And at the very end, as Janet said, the last scene, one of the last scenes, is she has to decide whether to, you know, shoot her Klingon lover. Or shoot Chakotay or Paris, whoever it is that is trying to get her back, and um, so they, um, of course, she sides she sides with the Maquis and with Janeway and with the Voyager against the Klingons. So she's basically she's like ripped her guts up three different ways in the show, and um, whether we had the, I can't remember we had different endings. We either had the Klingons self destructing and going away forever, or they just peel off and um, 
uh, 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 Janeway puts them down on a Class M planet and blows up their ship, which is kind of cruel. But then, hey, she <laughs> she did it in Caretaker, so what's the deal? Um, but that you know, we had different endings depending on what they wanted to do with Klingons, or we could give them their ship and say, you know, go away and never bother us again because we're going this way and you guys take off and go back that way. So, you know, and we had this uh, maybe an ending scenario where they every you know the show ends like normal and we say meanwhile on a planet you know further back in the delta quadrant and you come down and you see these klingons have a have a native race they've subjugated or these klingons are set up camp on a you know another batch like oh my god they're going to find more kind of just a hint so we had it totally set up where they could do all kinds of stuff but that was first season, and so number one, very quickly they went. Well, we were doing. We already have faces in development where she's literally split in two, so we won't do this real fast. And then it got to the second season. It's like, well, we had a Romulan, we had two Ferengis. We don't want to. You know, we're supposed to be out here by ourselves. We've got too many Alpha Quadrant people, so we're gonna we're gonna wait a year. Okay. Well, the next year was the year they brought Worf and the Klingons to DS9, and they went. Well, now we don't want to look like we're piling on the Klingon bandwagon. So after that, I was like. Okay, fine. We got paid for it, but they're never going to use this. The show's gone way too far. And by then, they were playing with Bolana and Paris being a couple. And the years went by, and the years went by, and we were like, well, yeah, we sold a story. It was nice. We got paid for it, <laughs> uh, but it'll never get made. And the last year, when Brandon was off with Rick developing Enterprise, and Ken Biller was the showrunner. Ken Biller had been on staff the first year, and he was in the story con – see, and then we had story conferences where we went in with Michael and Jerry and Ken, and Brandon was too busy to um, – this was the first season. Brandon was too busy to be there. He was working on his script. So it was just – it was Janet and me, and then Jerry and Michael and Ken Biller, and Ken Biller was junior boy, so he kind of sat in the corner and didn't say much. But basically it was a bottle show. And we had a story conference. They were going to send us away and, and write another story draft. And Michael had been off on Legend and had come back. So now he was all full of spit and fire and vinegar. And he was like, well, I love this idea. I love this show. But, you know, let's, let's not keep it a bottle show. Let's make a big deal out of it. Let's, instead of having them like ship to ship, let's have it be on a planet where the Klingons have subjugated somebody already, like old-time Klingons would do. They've, taken, you know, they've colonized the planet, and they're the masters. And, and we could have natives, and we can make an alien. He was all about aliens with a real language and subtitles, you know, then, kind of like in basics later on. And, 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 uh, and I remember Ken jumping up and saying, yeah, we could have it be like the Japanese in war. Like there's a Japanese soldier that's been in the jungle, and he doesn't know the war has been over for 20 years, and he jumps up. And, and I kept going, how is that? Anyway. So we went through the whole. We went through it and took their ideas like you're supposed to, and went home. And then we started writing versions where Bellana and either Chakotay or Paris were in a shuttle doing a reconnaissance over this class M world, looking for resources. And it was a jungle planet, and their their uh, shuttlecraft uh, dampened out. The engines went dead, and they crashed. But instead of crashing on land or in the water, they crashed in the top of this very dense foliage tree forage. Where they crash, but they're still like, you know, 300 feet in the air, and they open the hatch and look out, and you know, they almost like walk out of the get out of the shuttle and fall 300 feet. And um, anyway, it's, they get down, and they and then they look down, and they get to the ground, and oh my God, it's a Klingon, you know, in native rough garb, and it's womp bum bum, and that's the teaser, you know. And so we did that, and then by that time, like I said, the years went by, and, and oh, we're going to hold up on this reason, we're going to hold up for this reason, hold up for this reason. And um, so the last year, I went after the hiatus, everybody came back for the last season. I went around and said hi to everybody, and um, uh, Ken saw me and said, Larry, Larry, do you still have your notes from when we sold it? We've, we were looking in the archives for your notes and couldn't find it, and I was like, well, that surprises me. And uh, I said, yeah, of course I have them. Inside I'm going, oh, my God, oh, my God. Don't tell me they're going to actually, like, do it. But I knew, you know, Bolana and Paris were an item, and they, were, they, were, they got them married early in the seventh season. So and then she's pregnant. So, of course, it couldn't be the same story. It had to be way different. So the whole thing about it being the Klingon cult and the Kuvama and the disease and all that stuff, uh, and the baby was the prophecy – yeah, yeah, yeah. All that stuff was invented for the show because it was seven years later. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So really, the uh, the genesis of it was it was a Klingon generational ship who didn't believe they were allied, and uh, Belana is the central figure. So on one hand, it's like, oh, they didn't do the story. But on the other hand, it's like, well, it couldn't have really been ours. And then on the third hand, <laughs> Janet goes, I think our story was a lot better. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'd like you to um, refresh my memory about something. In, in, when we were in Sunion four years ago, uh-huh. you tell us a story about someday you were in Paramount lot and you heard some fuss and there were, there were people throwing out of the windows some props and sets and you ran up to save them. Oh, well, that wasn't me. That was, that was actually Richard Arnold telling me that story. Oh. When they were – and it's, it's a lot – now that we've been through the Christie's auction and watched what happened when you have a change in generations <laughs> of the studio or change in generations of Star Trek, it's what happened. But there was a time, I guess, in the um, 80s, in the late 80s, when uh, I guess uh, Gulf and Western had sold it to Paramount or whatever – um, they were cleaning out some storage areas around the lot, and he just was talking about remembering he heard this glass breaking and went down, and they'd had a place where they'd stored all the matte paintings, mm-hmm. the glass matte paintings from all the old years, and like, you know, matte paintings from black and white movies and Bob, you know, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope Road movies, you know, the road to whatever, and all the all these great movies, and they were upstairs, and there was a dumpster, you know, a big dumpster bin. On, on wheels, and they're just throwing stuff out the top floor and having it crash into the dumpster in the bottom. And they were these glass matte paintings that today would be worth, you know, maybe millions, I don't know, and great matte artists, <clears throat> including some of the things they inherited from Desi Lu, including like the Albert Whitlock matte painting. So, like the Starbase paintings from, you know, from Menagerie and Court Martial, and some of those, you know, background paintings were being. <laughs> Where literally had just been uh, lost and destroyed, and talking just talking about making you sick, and and the short sightedness. It's I always call it the arrogance of the new, whenever wherever whatever form it pops up. But it's people who come in and think, okay, well this is all old stuff, whatever it is, whether it's you know it's it, you know whether it's I don't know a, a, an, an office, and you walk in and you think, oh we don't need this anymore, and you throw it away, and then three or four years later somebody walks in and goes what. Why? Why did you guys throw that away? Because now we need it. <laughs> you know, it's something ongoing that is important enough to have a. Um, you know, it's it's materials either either for the information or because of themselves. And so, so yeah, it's the reason why Star Trek got popular in the '80s and nothing had been kept from the Desi Lu or you know stuff had been thrown away in the '70s. I think there was also a flood and some water damage at a storage place. But it's why in the 80s, if you look at the first merchandise and the first, you know, like videotapes, it's like the same crappy washed out pictures are on all the packaging because that's all they had before before digital enhancement and photoshopping and before making frame grabs. People were literally stuck with whatever photography they had, you know, and if you tried to make a dupe, you lost quality in the journey. So for a long time, the imagery on Star Trek was so bad, you know, in the 80s before Next Generation came up and had its own stuff. And even then, it wasn't great. Um, but anyway, that yeah, that was a lot of my world when I was working at Paramount in, in licensing and, and kind of seeing how a lot of that world worked. The, the things that fans got in their local stores, you know, it's like, really? Do we have to have the same picture of, uh, you know, the white rabbit on the <laughs> shore leave box? I mean, is it – can you not – Kirk in the triples pile? Is there – can we use one other picture besides, <laughs> you know? So um, – but yeah, but that was the story. That was the story. Right. Um, I got to witness, <laughs> you know, people selling off the archives after Enterprise ended. You know, th- that was kind of sickening and not sickening, but thank goodness it didn't go the. It was originally they were going to get rid of a lot more, but thankfully, um, as some cooler heads prevailed from licensing and, uh, you know, Mike and Denise and Dave Rossi and uh, other parties saying, let's not, can we just slow this down and not throw so much away quite yet? And uh, the fact they could make money on it and have good PR wasn't even like a factor. They were just like, uh, we're paying too much to store this stuff. Get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. So I saw that generation of, but I missed the first one. (laughs) Now now that you're talking about Enterprise, 
Um, first of all, uh, I do remember that you did a cameo in the last uh, episode. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> um, but uh, the serious question here is, uh, what's your personal opinion? Why do you think the, the series was cancelled? Oh, well, the series was cancelled. There were two or three things that happened halfway through Enterprise. UPN was the network it was on, and this is about... This is beyond Star Trek. This is, you know, mm -hmm. entertainment politics and the lay of the land. <clears throat> and when the UPN network, United Paramount Network, and um, the Warners Network, um, not CW, WB, when they both started, they were both um, the fifth network. Just like the way Fox, 20 years before that, had been the fourth network, and it was a real gamble to start up. And before cable and before all the satellite networks, and there were just – in America, there was just ABC, CBS, and NBC and public broadcast, PBS. And it was a big thing for Fox, and what's ironic is uh, when Barry Diller was the head of Paramount in the 70s, the original – you know, in, yeah, in the 70s, the motion picture, I think most people know, started off as – that script was the pilot to our movie mm -hmm. for Star Trek Phase Two, which was going to be – Exactly what Voyager wound up being, you know, 25 years later, uh, 25, 15, whatever, um, which was going to be, we're going to start a new network and we're going to use the power of Star Trek to be our flagship show as we make create this new network and we flesh out enough shows for all the different days. And it didn't come to pass. It fell apart. Mm -hmm. So they still had the Star Trek they'd been working on and they took the two-hour script and made it a movie. Well – Right after that, Fox got started, or about the same time, Fox, and they became the fourth network instead of the Paramount Network. Then, well, you know, years later, there's enough density in media and enough subscribers and cable had come along to where people were starting to get antsy and people were thinking it made sense to try to have a new fifth network, except there were two fifth networks at the same time mm -hmm. WB and UPN. And they both came out of the gate at the same time, but you can tell. Star Trek aside, you can tell which one of them had more coherent management and vision and administration because even though they were both small and tiny, the WB started started to have an identity and kind of got it together. And UPN had some good ideas, but they just went all different directions. They had some interesting one-hour dramas. They had some stupid comedies, <laughs> and they just kind of stumbled around. And yes, Star Trek Voyager – was always the best show on the network and always got the highest ratings. But the network is this, after two or three or four years, you could tell that you know WB was climbing. They were still both way behind the other four networks in numbers, but WB was doing better than UPN. So after two or three years of um, – actually five or six years and two or three different administrations at UPN, Les Moonves, CBS owned uh, – half or more a majority stake in UPN. So after about midway through Enterprise, after it had gotten launched to all the hoo-ha, you know, um, all the ballyhoo of PR, about two years in when the second season was really pretty thin, actually, on Enterprise, the writing, um, Moonves kind of like got disgusted with the way UPN was being run and said, okay, fine, I'm going to run it myself. <laughs> if you guys can't do it, I'm going to do it myself, basically. And... He looked at everything with fresh eyes and very cold business-like I, I mean, Star Trek, you know, basically he said, okay, Star Trek guys, Enterprise, I don't care that you were once the golden calf, but no longer. You either got to make your way or not. And so they all had always had tiny numbers, but everything on their network had tiny numbers. Mm -hmm. But now it was going to be a, we're going to find stuff that works. That's when they started adding wrestling <laughs> to UPN. And they basically were put on notice. You guys have got to do better. So at the end of the second season, it was basically, okay, this is pathetic, and you guys are out of here. You've got one chance. You know, you've got one year to do it, which is where the Zindi art came from. It's more Biff Bam Powell, you know, darker, grittier, whatever. And the ratings did get better, but they still weren't there. Because it was part of it was you, no matter what Star Trek did or anybody did, UPN was a crippled little network that wasn't even on the whole country. And they had this, you know, since it was a late network, they were on channels where 
you know, the local basketball team or the hockey team or whatever might be on, and they bump vo- – instead of showing it at 8 o'clock on, on Monday or Tuesday night, they're showing it at 2 in the morning. You know, so it wasn't even really a national show. It was maybe three fourths of the country saw it, and you had to be a really hardcore Trek person to watch it or to tape it. You know, whatever. And new people were sure weren't going to come along because it was so hard to find in a lot of the country. <clears throat> and um, anyway, that that's it. It basically the cold hard eye of of. Um, Capitalism looked it in the face and said, "Okay, dreams over. No one's protecting you just because you're Star Trek," and it, which was kind of silly anyway because there was no way any show was going to do well. And of course, we know now UPN and WB merged <clears throat> because it was too hard to keep them both going. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's it. And the last season of Enterprise, they were going to cancel it after three years, and only because. Paramount TV studio went to UP and the network and said, look, we need a hundred shows, you know, the old hundred shows thing. Mm. We need a hundred shows to syndicate it. Um, they were barely, they were in th- tapes too. They were barely thinking about DVDs then, but it was more that we will, we will cut the budget. We will pay more for the show. You guys pay the network pays less. We'll pay more. We'll cut the whole budget anyway. You know, and they wound up getting – they made the whole show digital. So Sony uh, cameras, if you look at the credit the last season, Sony cameras donated the digital cameras. So that was like another cost they cut. And um, they made less shows that year. They went to a 20 or 22-episode season. So uh, they found all these ways to make the shows cheaper for one more year. And there was this tiny, tiny chance that once they ch- – oh, and they changed over and Manny was made the showrunner. And Rick and Brandon, you know, took a back seat to develop other things. Um, and there was a tiny chance that if the ratings had gone like woohoo and gone crazy sky high, they could have come back and kept going. And the ratings did go up. They were all when they started those trilogies and they had Brent Spiner on and everyone was watching the ratings to see, you know. But the problem was it was still on a tiny little network. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't promote it, they wouldn't spend money, and the network wouldn't spend money to promote it, you know domestically so the ratings did go up but they and they went up pretty well but they still weren't enough to get you know upn's attention and go oh okay we'll keep you around so you know and then they finally i remember the day when they were it was halfway through shooting in a mirror darkly part two and the word came down that nope that's it and so for the first time in 18 years there was going to be no Mm-hmm. Star Trek on TV. There was going to be all these stages that had been here, all these offices that had been here for 18 years mm-hmm. were not going to be Star Trek. And there was going to be wind whistling through Star Trek Street without the trailers out on, you know, it was just going to be, everybody was kind of like, oh my God. And people who, the people who'd worked there the longest, it's like, I'm, I'm dead because I haven't worked anywhere else in it. No one in town knows me, mm-hmm. you know, because my resume <laughs> As a, as a worker, has all been at Star Trek for 18 years. It's like, oh. So there were a lot of um, sad, depressed, you know, bittersweet um, people. And a lot of people who knew that TV had changed, the industry had changed so that almost anywhere you went, it was not going to be like working on Star Trek. So, um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty bittersweet. And no one knew when there would be anything of any kind, you know, at the time. A movie, a TV show, or if it would really be ten or fifteen years before there was a Star Trek again. So it was it was an interesting, interesting time. But um, it's interesting if if Netflix had been around then the way it is now, or if people seriously thought about HBO and Showtime the way they do now. But the thing was, people there was this perception, aside from numbers, or perception that Star Trek was tired. You know, the people that didn't know Star Trek that were the suits around Hollywood. Just thought Star Trek was tired, quote unquote, and needed to be rested. Of course, what's silly is this is right when the fan films exploded, mm-hmm. and uh, it, and I kept saying it's not Star Trek wasn't tired. The producers were tired, mm, wow. and um, and but but that attitude permeated Hollywood, and at the time there was no way. You were going to get anybody to go, no, no, just jump it over here and we'll keep it going. Because people thought, no, we need to rest Star Trek. And meanwhile, the fans are going, no, no, no. And the fan base was growing. 
and it was about to explode. And and you know now we've had Netflix and the DVDs and the remastering, and there's there's tons more fans than there were in 2005. And oh, those JJ movies helped too, I guess. <laughs> but there's so much that showed that um, that there's way more fans now than there were in 05. And the people who had quit watching Voyager, quit watching Enterprise, you know, and there's quibbles you can have with it. But there's so many people now that are like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got, I got, I don't, you know, you don't appreciate what you don't have until you don't have it, you know. So, uh, so yeah, but that's, that's the Enterprise, that's the ballad of Enterprise. Mm. Is there any hope for the original timeline? Do you think that uh, there may be a chance uh, in the next few years for an uh, original timeline Star Trek movie or series uh, may be produced? Yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> movies. <clears throat> well, see, I mean, it's not just about, oh, you're just a fan and you're just, you know, being anal. I mean, that's where the, um, that's where the hours, that's where the hours are. Not just of product sitting on a shelf, but that's where the hours of people's emotional investment are. Even people who are not a fan yet, even people who have just become a fan in the last year or two, there's that library. Even if you didn't sit and watch every show every week since 1966 and you're you know, 80 now, <laughs> or even the TV era, you know, the modern era, it's not just a little, you know, a little fan goober thing you can claim. It's it's an emotional investment that makes sense to build on for another generation, mm. and it's it's about then it's about to me it's about business and promotion and marketing. Why do you fight this investment you've made? Why fight it? Now the big reason is because a lot of creatives, writers, go, "Oh my God, Canon! It's such a rock around my neck. I can't write shows." It's like, yes, you can. It's like part of it is if you write it, they will come. Mm. You know, pick a corner that hasn't been used yet and go there and do it. You don't have to. And this, you know, the worst thing would be to go. We have to reboot Next Generation like we did the original series. And it's like, no, don't know. Let's get, let's have something new. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you're going to use those characters and tell us something new. I mean, the the. The alternate universe, the, the bad robot movies, J Rip movies have given us tons of new fans. And I enjoy them, but they don't sit in my gut because they don't mean anything. They're, they're, at most, they're going to be, we're going to wind up with six or eight hours. Now, if there were other series that, you know, if they did an animated or the, that built on that universe, it might start fleshing it out. But half of Star Trek to me is that universe. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to use one of the pillars, one of the strengths of what you have, then you're you're kind of it's like, I don't know, it's like you're gonna build a you're gonna build a a, a home in the mountains and you don't put windows in your house, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you build a house at the shore, and you yeah and you don't build a deck and it's like you stay inside the whole time after you built your house in this lovely scenic wonder I you know um, I just don't get why you would why you would shoot yourself in the foot why you would um, not go there and it's it's again it's not just about oh i'm a bigger fanboy than you are haha <laughs> it's like that's that's human nature that's why not use that that uh, resource that's there that accumulation and you don't have to be uh, even ron ron and ira i've heard say oh i don't know a new show would have to be something totally new it's like no don't what where are you guys wh what happened to you who replaced you with an evil pod clone you know <laughs> Because look, the novel writers do it all the time. Mm. I mean, I you there are there are five or ten people I can name who would be thrilled to be, a, if not a staff writer, be a consultant. I'll do it. <laughs> you know, just write a memo. <clears throat> Here's a script. Okay, tell your story. Just change this, this, this. And I mean, it's been done. I I tell that story about the the two parter about on uh, DS9. Mm. Um, if you're unlucky enough to have heard it on a podcast somewhere or something. <laughs> About uh, uh, when uh, when Worf and Garrick are taken hostage by the Dominion, mm -hmm. and they found out that Bashir, and they found out that the real Martok has been switched out with, with changeling doubles. And the first time I read the draft, before it was written, thankfully, I was like, uh-oh, you've got Klingons in captivity. Why haven't they killed themselves? And 
Even Janet said, oh, don't be an anal fan, Larry. And I'm like, okay, but they're going to hear about it when they – and long story short, got the point across in the right way that um, that at least after birthright when they like hit you over the head 97,000 times that Klingons kill themselves in captivity or, or won't let themselves be taken hostage or else bad things happen to them. That uh, you know, it got it, it. It was it was uh, it was changed, and all it took was two lines of dialogue. You know, we didn't have to build a new set and hire nine actors. <laughs> it took two lines of dialogue, and that's my that's my message to a new series. It's like don't freak out over it. Come up with a cool premise and an idea. Spend your time researching it, and then once you're into the day to day grind of writing the show, have a consultant or two go. Oh no, but just do this and this and this. You know, or this and this. And now run. Now go. Tell your stories, talented people who have a Star Trek gene in your body. <laughs> you know, go do that. Don't worry about it. But that's that's what drives that. Mm-hmm. People are like, oh, you know, we can't do it. It's been too much. It's all been told before. It's like bullshit. No. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that's my opinion. And ours too. 